Welcome to season 13 of the Parenting Aces podcast, a proud member of the Tennis Channel Podcast Network. I'm your host, Lisa Stone, and this week we are bringing back a renowned coach, Rick Macy. I don't even know what to say about Rick other than you guys know him from the movie King Richard. You know him as the former coach of Venus and Serena Williams, Maria Sharapova, Andy Roddick, you name them. He's worked with them. Rick currently has an academy down in Boca Raton, Florida, and has worked with so many players over the years, including our co-guest this week, Dr. Niva, who coincidentally is from Georgia, where my kids grew up, and went on to train with Rick as a junior player, was number one in the South, was top 20 in the nation all growing up. Rick worked with her, coached her until she had the opportunity to go to Harvard University get her medical degree, and is now working as a neuromuscular neurologist. The two of them have teamed up to produce a book on the mental side of not just tennis, but life in general. It's called The Billion Dollar Mind, billion with a B, billion dollar mind. And I'm super excited to have them both on to talk about the impetus behind the book how tennis families can use this book and the lessons it contains to help their junior players achieve their goals, have a more positive experience throughout the junior tennis journey, and learn lots of great life lessons. So sit back, relax, be sure to check out the show notes for links to how you can purchase your copy of Billion Dollar Mind, and enjoy my conversation with Rick Macy and Dr. Nibba. Rick Macy, Dr. Niva, welcome to the podcast. Rick, welcome back to you, Dr. Niva. So excited to get to know you and introduce you to the Parenting Aces community this week. And before we kind of dig into the crux of the matter here, Dr. Niva, I would love to give you an opportunity to tell our audience a little bit about your tennis background, how you got started in the sport and how far you went in the sport that led you to where you are today. Absolutely. So I, I started tennis at age eight and uh, I grew up in Augusta, Georgia. And I guess tennis is the only thing that I, I could actually play in terms of any other sport. I was good at it, very consistent, very steady. And my parents taught me. And so they kind of revolved and uh, nuclear, they, they were just around me all the time. And I, they, they first start introduced me to tennis. But as a, as a youth, I, I really didn't have very good techniques. So I was a big a struggle, you know, and then I had to keep improving my game. And I remember using a lot of mental strength to improve my game and trying to learn it on my own uh, until guess whom I met? <laughs> uh, so I went, I was invited to his academy uh, down in South Florida. So uh, we take these trips from Augusta, Georgia, all the way down to South Florida uh, to train in his academy. And I learned a lot. He was number one in the South and raised to he makes it sound like you want that on the third. He was like a little wizard. I was like, oh, thank you. Like, so, yeah. So then, so I, you know, had to climb up to the top. It was not easy. Like I remember losing, losing, losing for so many years. And then finally in high school, I remember using a lot of mental strength and studying the game. And I was able to, you know, improve. I had a lot of knowledge about technique. And then uh, using, I think I use, I touch about it in the book here, uh, Billion Dollar Mind, but we talk about how to use mental strength exercises to be number one and to get into the habit of being number one. Uh, people are not used to it. A lot of my opponents would just, especially girls, lose right before they got on the court. And so I was like, okay, I'll take this match. So it was easy. They lost mentally. They just lost mentally. They were either not uh, they lose in terms of intimidation because of my ranking. I was number one in the South for, I think, a couple of years. I just kind of got used to being undefeated. And then I think I was like around in the 20s for nationally in the USDA. Um, and then from there, I trained at Rick's Academy, which was like the biggest blessing in my life. And of course, you know, he, we were going down the college path and uh, he wrote a letter for me to get into Harvard. So, and that's where I went. And I think that uh, background in tennis was, was crucial for me to do what I do now, which is I'm a physician, a doctor, and I run a big neuromuscular program in Orlando. 
Awesome. Uh, let, me, and, let me interject here. Sure. I just think that the, sure. the, from tennis and everybody watching needs to understand this, you know, whatever, wherever you end up, high school player, you know, college player, you fortunate enough to make it in the pros, the things you learn from tennis through the hard work and discipline and problem solving and doing things on your own. Uh, obviously, uh, you know, for her and her twin sister has, you know, just taken them to such extraordinary heights as her being a doctor and one of the best in the world at what she does. Oh, Rick, that's so kind. But yeah, I agree with you. Like the, the hard work, I think is crucial. I mean, sure. that gets you through medical school and gets you through, you know, of course, went to Harvard and gets you through the hardest days in residency, because I think uh, nothing can beat the hard work you have in tennis and, and all the grueling. I, and tennis is just an incredible sport because you learn how to rely on yourself. And that technique is is, is very important. Yeah, I love that. And we talk about that a lot on Parenting Aces and, you know, on our social media and our, our consults is the fact that tennis offers the opportunity to learn lessons that apply both on the court and off the court. Um, I love that about this sport. And yeah. it's it's interesting. I recently spent a couple days at my niece's soccer tournament. She plays on her high school team. And just noticing how different it is to be in a team sport environment because my my experience as a sports parent has solely been with tennis and it was it's a very different environment uh, when you're looking at team sports equally opportunistic in terms of life lessons and skills and all of those things but just a little bit different when you're talking about an individual sport versus a team sport which really helps us kind of segue into this new book of yours. And the two of you have teamed up to produce Billion Dollar Mind. It's now available. We will have links in the show notes on parentingaces.com. So I want everybody to make sure that they check that out. But you decided not only to write a book, but also to then come back and write a kid's version of the same book. Can Rick, maybe you can talk about this. Why did you decide to offer a double version of this publication? Well, I think, well, even younger kids can, you know, get so much out of Billion Dollar Mine. Now, all the kids at the Academy, you know, a lot of them have already read it, but there's a kid's version that's just scaled down. Um, what would you say, like more? It is yeah, simpler. And it's just a little maybe simpler, yeah, you know, so much. but at the end of the day, they both have the, the same value, the same gold nuggets that can, you know, just whatever you do, you're going to do 25% better after reading a book. So we figured we'd do it for the kids also. Um, but the response that we've got, you know, especially myself here at the Academy, it blown away. And it's something they go back and keep reading and reading and reading because there's so many uh, amazing stories and if they can do it, I can do it. And your mental strength and the way you look at it, you'll be so inspired by reading the book. You know, I mean? it, it doesn't have anything to do with tennis. Okay. Um, it can, it can do, it can have something to do with anything, mm -hmm. but the kids version, I think uh, uh, we needed it. And yeah, I think you also think it, it's so important for kids to have. Yeah. I mean, they do. I mean, it's a fundamental uh, need for our world. I think the kids need to have an ability uh, to have a strong mind, which we do not teach in schools. This, I mean, this is one of the most important yeah. skills and we don't teach it. I think Rick teaches it in his academy. So if you go there, you get it, you just see him and you get a strong mind. <laughs> you're like, it's like, it's just, you're just fine, osmosis. You know? huh? <laughs> I mean, he's like, he's like teaching in the rain. He's there on Sundays. You know, he doesn't take a day off and he's up at like two o'clock in the morning. I mean, it's, it's already there. It's like, he is the strong mind. He is the billion dollar mind. But I, you know, you get that from the academy, get that from like the notes he has. But I think the book is an opportunity for everyone else. And there's just two versions, especially for the younger kids to be able to understand um, because I have kids myself and I tried to have them read like the longer version and it was just a lot. Yeah. They were just asking, you know, how do you define this and how do you define that? So I thought that the smaller version would both, uh, you know, would be an opportunity for the younger kids to be able to access something like this and at least think about. 
mm-hmm. you know. Yeah. So Dr. Niva, for our audience that's not familiar with, neuro, I'm, I'm looking at this because I don't want to mess up what you are. You are a neuromuscular neurologist. What does that mean? What What is your day to day? I think Rick asked me that too. That's a funny question. Okay. Yeah, so this is this is a great question. So basic and neuromuscular neurologist deals with patients who are weak or have uh, numbness and pain. So they have problems with their muscle or nerve. So so essentially what I deal with is that patients that come in and they were fully functioning, they were walking just yesterday and now they wake up and they can't walk. Mm-hmm. Uh, or they have like, you know, diseases such as ALS where they have weakness in their muscles and so they they don't have much time to live. They probably have, you know, many majority on average one to two years to live, or they, they come late and they have a few months to live. So I have patients that are weak, they're in wheelchairs, they're born with diseases that affect their muscle and nerve. Um, so anything to do with the muscle and nerve is in uh, my core <laughs> to okay. say. And so I, that's what I deal with on a day-to-day basis. So I get up in the morning, I, I, I see I have a lot of patients that come in with diff- different muscle diseases or nerve diseases. And so they're in pain, they have cramps, they have weakness, they have all kinds of things. Some of them have rare genetic disorders, which is kind of my specialty in research. And I do, I, I take care, I you know, try to figure out their problem. Um, so so yeah, it's, can... it's unusual for a doctor who deals with physical ailments to embrace the notion of mindset and the importance of positive mindset in healing the physical body. They're, they're typically very neutral. Yeah, no, actually I need this book almost every day. <laughs> and, and some of my patients have actually read it and they've changed their lives mm-hmm. uh, because they've needed the positivity to get them through some of the hardest times in their life. Sure. And so I use it as a, as a tool. Um, I use it as a tool to help them lose weight, to help them reach their goals, to help them, you know, there's a chapter on visualization, some of them uh, to get them to visualize movement. Uh, The book is really, I think a lot of uh, medical issues in general, and especially neuromuscular issues uh, need positivity. And we don't have a lot of treatments. And that's really the unfortunate truth for some of our diseases. Patients are born with weakness and they're in wheelchairs. And I see some, it's really incredible to see some patients. I, I, I'm i blown away by some patients who have zero muscle. They have no, they can be, they just talk and they, they have, they're, they, they have a husband or they're married and they, some of them even have kids. It's like, wow. And then, then I have people who are fully functioning and they don't have any of that. Mm. And it's interesting. It's all about the mind. And so I, every day I have to remind people, I mean, this book is incredible. Um, and I think it's a, it's a good tool. So it, it kind of, my patients almost encouraged me to write this in some ways. And of course, Rick, I, I wanted to do it for a long time, but it's right up, even though it's not entirely psychiatry, it's really right up the alley uh, for mm-hmm. what I do. That's a great question because yeah. it's more than the, the, the medical part. She does so much with the, the mind. It's incredible. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And patients are really, they're just paralyzed by their thoughts. Yeah. Sure. I mean, as, and and I'm going to just segue this back to junior tennis because that's what we're about here at Parenting Aces. And one of the big topics of conversation that comes up over and over and over and, and understand we are now in year 13 of doing this. So this is a topic that I have addressed multiple times over the years is the topic of cheating, bad line calling, um, you know, manipulating scoring unfairly. All of these things are part and parcel, sadly, of not just junior tennis, but college tennis, adult tennis, um, professional tennis at the entry levels where they don't have chairs on every court. So I would love to kind of talk about Billion Dollar Mind in the framework of how junior players can use the techniques in your book to manage their response when things aren't going the way they want them to go on the court in terms of their opponent, in terms of their own play, all of those those factors. So Rick, I'm gonna start with you because I I know mindset is is very important to the type of teaching you do when you work with players. And I'm gonna separate teaching from coaching um, 
And this is something I recently learned the difference. And, and so I know that teaching is an integral part of what you do, Rick, to help these players reach their potential. So when you are teaching a young player and they come back to you and say, I played this tournament, this kid was hooking me right and left, making horrible calls. I just, you know, dissolved um, as a result of that. What do I do to, to help myself handle this next time? What are some of the, the tricks of the trade maybe, or, um, some some guidance that you can offer up that you've included in the book as well well first off i love the question and you're asking the right person because <laughs> i get this all the time and have for 30 40 years but i gotta go step by step number one it starts with perspective you gotta understand and expect you're gonna get cheated expect it because of the way junior tennis is set up, and like you said, college and adult, you don't have umpires like you see on television. So just the way it's structured, whether it's on purpose or not on purpose, you got to first understand it's it's expect to be cheated. I know it's a funny way to look at it, but if you've already prepared for it in your mind, you're not going to blow a gasket in the tiebreaker when it does happen. Right. And a lot of people, unfortunately, cheat on purpose. And some do it accidentally and everything's in the eye of the beholder. You might think it's in, they think it's out and you might be wrong and they might be right. So even you got to understand, this is a very tricky situation when we talk about cheating, but it starts number one with perspective. That's number one. Number two, you got to understand that you got 20 seconds to flip it in your mind. Like it happened 20 years ago. You got to go back to the fence. Okay. Turn your back. OK, take a deep breath, come back the other way. And when you come out like the great Maria Sharapova, who I had when she was in a bubble, she had this innately. I mean, she had it better than Venus, Serena, Caparati, Roddy, anybody. I, I was just stunned about her mind control. Now, that must have been genetic or a little innate. She was a wizard at 11. I said, everybody, she, this girl's in a bubble. So she could handle things better already young age. But if you understand it's perspective first, then you got 20 seconds to get the show on the road. Okay. Now, if you're going to let it bother you, unfortunately, they're probably going to do it more because mm. some coaches will even say, Hey, make a bad call. This is sad. I mean, not in the realm I deal in, but I know there's coaches that probably say that just get them upset and they'll blow a gasket and da 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 da. That short term, you know, it makes you feel good in the moment. You're developing very bad life skills if that's what someone's telling someone to do on purpose. But I would tell every player, and this is what I do in practice, because practice, it's like, it's not as important. I say when the person cheats you, okay, look at it as a compliment. And they they look at and like I even have students now they get cheated and they go. Hey, Rick, they're complimenting me. You know, it's the funniest thing. I had a 10-year-old telling me that because he gets like hooked every week during the lesson. He goes, they're complimenting me. Where before he would put his hands up and go crazy and he would just be out of control. Now, I got to take it a little further and Dr. Nib can chime in. The great King Richard Williams, he used to tell me, he goes, okay, Rick, today can VW pay, play the biggest cheater in the academy? I go, well, we got a lot of those, so take your pick. No, this oh, is gosh. what Richard used to say, because he wanted VW and Serena to deal with life skills and yeah. problems and how to problem solve. Now, you don't want that on a regular basis, but he wanted someone who we all know when they're close or hits the line, they're calling out every time, you know? It's not like basketball. You step on the line, it's out. They, there's some people that just, Unfortunately, you're like that. But he wanted that to make him rougher and tougher. And I know that's uh, kind of harsh when you're in tournaments and it's close. But in practice, okay, uh, if it doesn't kill you, it's going to make you stronger. And it definitely worked out for Venus and Serena having that. Not all the time, but right. he actually would encourage that. But how to deal with it, 20 seconds, 20 years, go back, come back out, Mr. Positive, everything's great. So you can flip it around and show your opponent, hey, I'm bulletproof. 
Nothing bothers me. Because if you let it bother you, I guarantee you're going to motivate them and they'll probably do it more. Yeah. Dr. Niva, I mean, are there pieces in the book that address this particular issue? Maybe not specifically cheating, but dealing with, you know, being in a situation where you're you're treated unfairly for whatever reason. Absolutely. And Rick touched upon one of the chapters, which is called Flip It. We do have a chapter in the book that talks about how to flip things in the mind. And so I think that was perfect because that's exactly what you need to do. When things don't go your way, you have to have an ability for your thoughts to be flipped. In fact, I mean, you even talk about this where if the crowd is booing, right? Wasn't it Michael Jordan that's like yeah. playing better? Uh, when there is an environment that's against them. So it motivates people. So you have to take that wrong and motivate it. Uh, you know, I remember I was telling Rick, I played the orange ball and someone cheated right on. You know, it's so painful. It is so painful because like it made all the difference from going, you know, I was going from three all to being like, you know, four two. And it was not, not a fun experience and it was really devastating. But I can tell you some other techniques as well that, that the book talks about. Mm -hmm. um, one is, the, of course, we talk about focus because focus is really important. It's the mental technique that we have to use to kind of continue to uh, keep our uh, mind on the goal. Um, once you start getting off track, you know, all of a sudden, you know, we forget what you're you're there for, which is to win the match and to go next, you know, to focus is so important. And, you know, the other thing that I think is so helpful, and it's just a small thing, but if people have positive affirmations, they start saying positive things to themselves instead of focusing on the, that, you know, negative, that, that bad call, which could obviously destroy you. And you keep saying, you know, I will win the match. I will win it. I am great. I am awesome. And so saying positive affirmations that really can get people back on track, especially when it's a bad day. And it's like, now you're down four, two, and you have to like play this incredibly uh, difficult opponent who's ready to destroy you, you know, right. and it's, it's hard because they're so hungry and you're sitting here like wanting to beat them. I never forget that. And it, and you have to kind of climb out of a hole. So it takes, you have to switch it. There's no other option, I don't think, you know. And also we talked a little bit about the, you, about the breathing because when you get excited and upset, you're going to go a hundred miles an hour. And But it takes a lot of people to have discipline. You know, a lot of people can read the book or they might hear it, but will they listen and will they apply it? And that's yeah. the art of the deal, you know. Yes. And there's some step-by-steps so, -step to go about doing that. But I'll go back. It's so much about perspective and when you do get a bad call, any juniors listening to this or parent, they should immediately, if they can, call for the umpire. That's true. You know, right away, that shows you're a competitor. That shows you're respecting the game. Because if you don't ask for an umpire, you're not you're not even respecting yourself as a competitor. You know, greatness would never let that go. Plus, you send a message to the person on the other side that I'm not going to let you get away with this. Because they might simmer down until you get in a tiebreaker when it's the most important point, then they grab you, you know, and we know tennis, it's a point here or there that makes it different. So uh, a lot of this is in the book and people are going to love a lot of this. Uh, and it starts with perspective and how you look at it and, you know, control what you can control, not what you can't control. You know, this is a big thing. They've already cheated you, but there's many, many things now that you can control moving forward after you get a bad call. I love that. And, you know, mm -hmm. we, we do a really good job with our junior players, getting them on court, having them hit a lot of balls, practice patterns, practice footwork. We don't do as good a job practicing the mental side of the game. And I think part of that is, first of all, it's typically kind of boring. Um, the kids, you know, they, their attention spans have gotten shorter and shorter. We know this. Um, and so we have to find challenging ways to get them to commit to practicing these things. What are some of the things, Dr. Niva, that you have discovered or created to really kind of incentivize the younger kids to commit to practicing these mental skills? That's a beautiful question. So I, I, there's a couple of uh, things that I can think of. Number one, it's not boring to win. <laughs> it's definitely <laughs> not boring to win. So when people start using these tech, my kids or kids in general start using and they start winning, oh my gosh, and even myself. I remember reading affirmations when I was a kid and 
uh, it, it was life changing. I talk about it in the book, but it was like now winning and it just became addictive. So mental strength became, you know, the bread and butter of whatever I do. I always had that uh, in me. So definitely not born to win. I think it's also not boring to be happy. You know, this is something where now you're finding like more joy in life. You're being able to not get bogged down by the external environment. And Rick always, I mean, you used to see like if he calls me, I mean, so much positivity and it's so much enjoyment and life is so fun. Um, so th that's really what motivates a lot of people and kids, of course, they get used to, I remember uh, my kid, before I wrote this book, she would always look in the mirror and say, oh my gosh, you know, like now I have a bad hair day and oh, I don't look good. And, and I just, I'm like, I, I flip it in just a second. I'm like, oh my gosh, look how pretty you are. Let's take a picture look at this picture. And now she's like, oh wow, she's smiling. And all of a sudden, and that's how the fundamental premise of this book is that our thoughts are so fickle, like all of a sudden it's bad and now it's good and it's bad and it's good. And, you know, so, so we have to be able to control those thoughts. And I remind my kids all the time to do that. And they get into the habit of being happy. And you always say, train your mind to be positive. So it's incredible. It's a great feeling. Well, Let me chime in on that. First, I love this question. And let's just talk a little bit about the Serbian sniper. Let's talk about Djokovic. Okay, <laughs> listen, the guy, you know, 24 grand slams. What's he even playing for? He's number one. He won three out of four last year. He's still hungry. All the money in the world. Doesn't have to do anything. Why is he still doing it? Because you people have no idea how much you got to train to maintain, you know, but he's trying to get better. Why? He's all about the competition. So. Any coach or parent should always understand this is always about I love to compete. I just love to compete. Okay, forget forehand, backhand, serves, strategy. Forget all that. The best thing any parent or coach can do is teach someone to be a better competitor. And if you're a better competitor, you're going to handle pressure better. This is what people don't understand. The great Andy Roddick was like that. When he was a little kid, he was like a mosquito. This guy would always bother me, and his thirst for competition was like no other, coming back for more. And he was just always there. And I think from that, you you handle like when people cheat you, or you are working on the mental part. You know what I mean? Yeah. We could get into visualization, which I'm sure when the Joker, when he retires, he will give all the things that he has done and people, people know about his diet. People know sure. about a lot of stuff. They have no idea how he's trained his mind because uh, this wasn't innate. Maybe, you know, he's the contortionist or the rubber band man. Maybe that's genetic, but his mind, he wasn't a brutal competitor when he first got on the tour. Well, I was going to say, mean, I mean, we've seen a massive change in him since he first huge. came on the scene. You know, he was the guy that was, you know, kind of made fun of for retiring matches, you know, oh, his, you know, he was having trouble breathing. And, and yes, he may have had physical illnesses that were contributing to that. But I think he has found a way to use his mind to overcome those those obstacles. Right. And that's. I think what you're talking about. And, and I want to just clarify something um, that you said, Dr. Niva, because you talked about how it's fun to win. And I know for, for junior tennis, especially, we've had kind of this obsession about outcomes and, and really trying to educate families on focusing on the process rather than the outcome. And so when you talk about winning, yes, I know you're talking about winning tennis matches and yes, it's fun to win tennis matches, but there are ways to be a winner, to win at something besides just the overall outcome of a single match or a single tournament. And I, I think just from what I know about you, from reading about you, I think that's what you're alluding to more than just the the single match or the single tournament win, although that's part and parcel of it. I think both. And I think Rick and I talk about this all the time. It's like winning uh, in life, which is about winning because you've improved, because yes. you've learned. And I think that's what uh, winning is in my mind. And I think that's what, you know, I, I meant, of course, winning, Tournaments is obviously the best part because you're winning, but you have to you have to be able to learn how to improve yourself, 
and and learn from every single match, every single experience, and keep improving yourself every day. That's winning in it's of itself. That's what we're talking yeah. about. So when when parents say, "Oh, the person lost a match," I mean, they could have won because they learned from it, right? Right. So you're always winning if you can actually have a good attitude and continue to improve yourself from anything you do. So uh, I feel like when I said winning, I really didn't mean like being number one winning because you are winning and it's great to have trophies. It takes, but it takes an effort. And I also thought, think that winning comes from those experiences when I did lose, I was winning in some way because I was always learning, you know, always reflecting on myself. There was never a day. I remember the matches that I, I still remember the matches that I lost. I'll never forget uh, teaching lessons from those matches. And so I was winning in some way. Yeah. So absolutely. Yeah. Is that, I mean, we talk about yeah. this all the time. You know, yeah. let, you know, also regarding that it's, it's tricky because it's kind of two questions. It's all about the process and in practice, you break it down microscopically. That's where you learn and then you compete. Okay. And everybody asks you after you play the match, uh, they don't ask you, how'd you play? They ask you, did you win? Right. Okay. And that's what we are in our society, not just tennis, all sports. It's not where you start. It's where you finish, okay? Like Venus never won a match in three and a half years. Number one, because she didn't play any, okay? So that's a whole other podcast as we talked about before. So you got to understand it's about the process. It's about getting better. You know, if it doesn't kill you, you're getting stronger. I know you need to win once in a while to feel good about yourself. Maybe it depends on each person. And that's where you need a great coach and a great role model a father figure and a parent who's going to be more of a psychologist and a motivator, you know, and they're getting so much more out of this than just winning. Then on the flip side, some kids are so obsessed about winning, you know, they're, they're playing people where they're really not even improving. Absolutely. You know, they, 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 even they do that on the tour. They travel to Ethiopia and play a tournament to get points. You know, it's really a lost leader of where you're at with your ability, you know, but at the end of the day, you know how good you are. Uh, by looking in the mirror. So I think everybody needs to understand, you know, uh, the wins and losses will take care of themselves. It's not where you start, it's where you finish. But along the way, you're going to acquire so many things, so many things. But the parents, because they might not understand, they base it all on winning and losing, mm -hmm. you know, and that's unfortunate. Okay. Uh, I told someone a story this week. The number one girl who won the Orange Bowl in the 12s long ago, played a set against Serena Williams and she was 12. They played a set against each other, same age. And cause I taught this girl from Germany and they played one set. The girl from Germany won six Oh in 20 minutes. They were the same age yeah. and Serena was 12. Yeah. The girl did get to 81 in the world and Serena became the goat. So yeah. my point is, <laughs> okay. From all your failures, from all the disappointments, you're actually winning. And a lot of times when you're winning, you could actually be losing, but parents don't understand that. Okay. And it's, listen, you grow three inches and gain 20 pounds. You're there set smiling, ripping the ball cross court, where if you don't have that, you're barely getting to the ball or you got to hit a lob, mm -hmm. especially in junior tennis. You know what I mean? Yeah. And parents need to understand that this thing changes as you get older, but the one thing you want to keep developing, and that's what the book is gold on gold is your mind. Mm -hmm. And that's how I evaluate people at a young age, you know, where that can go and what's inside of them. Well, and, and it's tough because when you're working with a young child, let's say somebody that's eight years old, you know, they, they are a fraction of the version of themselves that's going to eventually emerge when they're fully grown and fully mature. And so there is this opportunity to, to nurture the mind, nurture the ability to focus, nurture the ability to flip the script as, as you guys were talking about. And I think a lot of coaches miss that opportunity. I think Correct. a lot of parents miss that opportunity because we just don't understand the process. And so I feel like Billion Dollar Mind is a way for us as parents also to educate ourselves for our kids' coaches to educate themselves on how to use these techniques to really maximize the potential of these kids, not just as tennis players, but, you know, maybe as 
doctors someday in the future, maybe as coaches someday in the future, who knows where they're going to go, but a strong mind is going to help them reach whatever their goals are in life on and off the tennis court, which is what you guys keep saying and why we want everybody to buy a copy of this book and, and really delve in. If there were one nugget that you could pull out of the book and just blast worldwide, universe-wide, to help as many people as possible, is there one that you can pick out that, that you feel like is the one? And, and I'll give you each a chance to answer that because maybe you have different ones. I got two answers. Okay. Uh-oh. Okay. Her and me. How's that? <laughs> No, listen, you're getting you're getting so many private lessons from Rick Macy and all my experience of not just helping, you know, people like Dr. Niv go to college and you know, Harvard and all these people forget the cream of the crop that a lot of people know that I taught how they're wired and how I influence their mind. And I think I mentioned to you before. B.W. and Meek at the after party at the red carpet said, Rick, we were literally brainwashed to be number one. That was probably the best compliment ever that I got because I made such an impression mentally how they looked at competition, how they looked at the world, how they handled problems, you know, uh, made them very positive. That environment that I created to extract greatness was like incredible. You know, because I had a lot invested, obviously, but still I do that for all the students. And th that is in the book. All these things from myself, uh, just gems on gems for everybody to share. And then you got the genius from a medical profession. You know what I'm saying? And so you got the daily double, but people can go back to this book time after time after again. But the two best things about the book are the people you're interviewing today. <laughs> Yeah. I love that. That's the best compliment. I think this book is the best compliment for you. You know, you, you this is Rick. I mean, this is he is billion dollar mind and he has mastered it. And I think the the main uh, thing I've learned from Rick, um, and one of the quotes in there that I kind of I really love, and I think I say this to myself every morning is you have to train your mind to be positive. We do not train our minds. We just do not. We we're so uh, critical of ourselves. You're so used to being, you know, judgmental of ourselves. We get negative thoughts that seep in. Uh, we get insecurities, fear, all kinds of things. You've got to train your mind. And Rick embodies that every day. I, you know, and I, whenever I talk to him, it's like, it's like energy. It's like positivity. It's like the sun, you know, it like warms you up, heats you up. It's just so energetic and so positive. You have to train your mind. And if you don't train your mind, uh, you're getting behind. I would say Holy, that was a good one. But also, you know, like, you know, because this is kind of what I do mentally for all the students, you know, forget the visualization, meditation, and these other, you know, high powered things you can do. But this is a medley or a smorgasbord of what I do all the time. And it's in here. Mm -hmm. And whatever you do, it's going to, it's going to inspire you, then you got to apply it. And they can say, well, you know, that Rick does that, and you know, that must have helped whoever you know he's taught. You know, they have to understand, uh, and though they might listen more to me than mom and dad, yeah, you know what I mean? Because the mom and dad is trying, they're doing that out of love, but it, it the wires get crossed, and the parents can actually use the book as look, look at this. Because a lot of people aren't going to come to Boca and they, they can't maybe afford a lesson or whatever that might be, but mm -hmm. it's so many shits what's in the book mentally uh, people are just going to, they're going to be blown away. They're going to be blown away because they already have the, my phone's blown off of the people that got it under their Christmas tree. I love it. I love it. Yeah. You know, one of the things that sometimes happens with, with books, with podcasts, with apps, all of these things is we start off very motivated to, you know, absorb the the knowledge and, and try to internalize it. And then something happens and we get distracted and it just kind of falls by the wayside and, and we forget to apply these great lessons that we've read or heard or learned. 
Is there a tip that maybe you guys can share with our audience, for especially for the parents, to help their kids stay connected to the lessons that they're going to get from reading Billion Dollar Mind, from listening to this podcast, from any other work they're doing to, to improve their mental state when they're training and competing? Because I feel like that's a big frustration for a lot of families. Yeah, I would say, so one of the things that I think what you're implying is that, yeah, you can read it, you can feel good for the day, you can feel good for the week and say, oh, this is a great a life-changing experience. And uh, I love this book. And now I may have won the tournament. You may have won a match because of it. And then all of a sudden pressures come back and you lapse into the old version of who you were. Exactly. And you forget, you forget this book, you forget the memory, you forget all the lessons. And I think it goes back to what I really love is the training part of it. It really is a train. You have to train your mind every day to be positive. And in order to do that, this does require a reread. I, I would say that, you know, so, so parents do need to say, look, go revisit the book. Uh, when I did do positive affirmations and try to build my mental strength, it was not done overnight. It wasn't done in a week. I would say it was done six months to a year. And then I continued. I continued with it. I continued to read. I continued to invest my energy in, in learning more about mental strength. So this is not like an overnight thing. Uh, it, it might help you overnight, but yeah. it's got you in order to keep it. Just like how, I don't know if uh, we can always compare it to like how, uh, you know, I know Rick runs every day. I know I'm always doing abs and, and running. I bike every day. We got to, you know, we exercise our body. It's the same thing with the mind. We've got to exercise it. We've got to make sure it's strong. We also got to feed it the right information. So this is just for parents to understand this is not something that they just read. It's a one and done deal. It's 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 something they have to keep almost every day. Mm. People keep mm. affirmations all over. I mean, you see Rick's wall here. Yeah. It says how to be a winner. You know, <laughs> he does it on his own wall. So like he reminds himself every day he's here. Winners and losers. And I I love it. So this is just a, a natural thing, right? Yeah. It's, it sounds you know, like also, it's a habit that's got to be yeah, built. Yeah. But let me let me answer your question. I think yeah. you know it comes down to um, if the kid has to take ownership. What's my goal? I want to be the best I can be. Okay, whatever that means. I want to play high school tennis, college tennis. I want to you know be a pro. I make them say it. Now they got to own it. Now back to the book. First off, they should be the book. It's also like a journal. You can go back in there and take notes. And there's oh, like sections that. in there to keep score and take the temperature. This isn't one and done. This is something for a lifetime that people will continue to go back, you know, and get information from and feed your brain. Just like a lot of kids want to feed their mouth, you know, instead of putting it into your mouth, what are you putting into your brain every day? And this positivity, you know, it's changing a mindset little by little. Or even if they want to write these things down, I'm just a firm believer. I make people keep a journal. Okay. They have to write it down. They look at it every day. There's too many influences with children and kids in the world and adults of what they hear, you know, what they watch on TV around their friends. And there's too many other things that can go into your subconscious or it's right in front of you where you every day want to do this. It's discipline. It's structure. If you don't have that, okay, well, first off, if you have that, it's going to help you whatever you do. Yeah. Forget tennis. It's going to help you in whatever you do right. in life. And this is a big thing now uh, for parents because there's more distractions uh, than when we all grow up, especially when I grew up. Okay, there's a lot more distractions. So that would be write it down, look at it every day, empower yourself. But that takes discipline and that takes ownership. So if you don't want to be the best you can be, or you just want to do, you know, a little bit here, or a little bit there, that's okay. Mm -hmm. Then you got to own it. That's going to come back to bite you unless you change through your adult life. Well, and I think this is really important what you just said, because I, again, this is a topic that comes up quite often is having an open line of communication between the parent and the child about what the child's goals are. And those change. We know this, you know, kids at age eight, their goal might be to be number one in the world. But by the time they're 14, 15, their goal might be to play high level college tennis or just to make the varsity team at the high school. And 
you know, so it's important that that dialogue continue, but not just allowing the, the junior player to state what their goal is, but then to really understand the steps involved in achieving that goal and making the commitment to put the work in to do the steps necessary to achieve the goal. And, and that commitment to the work also can change as the kids grow and their interests expand and their worlds expand. So, you know, again, it's, it's part and parcel of developing the whole athlete and the whole human. You don't just work on the forehands and backhands. You don't just work on flexibility. You don't just work on footwork. You also have to incorporate the mental side of it and train that on a regular basis alongside the physical training, along with good sleep habits, good nutritional habits, you know, all the things that's, it, it all has to work in, in Congress to help these kids achieve what they want to achieve. Absolutely. You know, I, I've been fortunate to be, forget athletes in all sports, some of the most successful people uh, in the world. And the one common thread, they're the most positive creatures that ever walked the face of the earth. I don't care what they do. I'm just telling you, okay, mm -hmm. the, the wiring is different and just, but it's hard to get into that habit. You just don't wake up and do it on Saturday. Okay. That doesn't work. Okay. There's too many distractions. You get you little by little, by little, by little, you take the steps before you know it, you're at the penthouse. And we're not talking about hours a day. We're talking five minutes, right? Yeah, I mean, that's it. Yeah, that's it. This isn't a massive time suck that we're trying to get you to incorporate into your kids already overly programmed schedule. This is something they can do while they're brushing their teeth. This is something they can do while they're stretching, you know, while they're practicing um, their forehands. It can be a mantra that just goes through the mind that, you know, they, they work on little bits throughout the day and it's so doable and it's really sad how few of our kids are practicing these techniques and, and really how few adults are practicing these techniques. I think you guys could change the world with this, quite honestly. That's, that's, well, that's, that's the game plan, you know, and it can help so many people. And, you know, everybody will tell you it's a game of inches from one ear to another, okay? All the top pros in any sport, they tell you how much is mental. Everybody can run and jump and, you know, groundies are similar. They got similar genetic qualities. It's the mind and how you handle stuff. I mean, there's better athletes out there than Djokovic. There's better athletes out there than Federer. They don't have grand slams. Okay. It's more, it's a package, but the mind is the wild card. And through all my experiences, if you can handle stuff, okay. And then you have a few other attributes you'll definitely get the most out of your ability, no matter what profession you go into. Love that, love that. All right, before we wind up, I wanna just give you all the opportunity to let our audience know how to get the book and how to reach out to the two of you if they're interested. So you can, you know, you can buy this on Amazon. It's easy to buy. You can probably search on Amazon. And uh, there's a Kindle version, there's a paper for that version. There's obviously a kid's version, which is very small. Um, it's a shortened version. And then we have uh, getting an audio book out soon. We hopefully we're going to go for that. But that will be, uh, well, that'll be very soon. So, yeah. yeah. And again, we'll yeah, have no, the links. Amazon, just Amazon.com. You can yeah. go, you can get the book. Uh, you know, people that come to the Academy, a lot of the people, you know, autograph it, get a picture. Um, you know, they're just, the, the reviews I've gotten from the book uh, is the best feeling in the world simply because they look at it all the time and the parents do also. It's a, that's, that's the best feeling in the world. So I'm able to reach like, you know, we're able to reach millions and millions of people and eventually around the globe with the book. And, and the healing people, and the, my patients, when they're like, yeah, they're patients. feeling better and now we can enjoy Christmas and New Year's because our mind is feeling better and we're not worried so much that's that's a great feeling as well so I love that. definitely a must read 
Okay. I love it. We will have the links in the show notes on parentingaces.com. Um, Rick, if people are interested in coming to train at the Rick Macy Tennis Academy, uh, give us your website real quick. It's www.rickmacy.com. Okay. So Info at rickmacy.com. If they email, I answer everyone personally. I have for 40 years. I get back to them, you know, uh, within 24 hours. My phone's even on the website. I talk to a lot of people personally. They go, wait a minute. Is this Rick himself? I go, then they know the boys kind of from the movie, I guess. <laughs> Berthold did a good job. So yeah, I'm very accessible. And You mean you from the about- Parenting Aces podcast. That's where they recognize you from. There you go. There you go. <laughs> yeah. But I teach anybody, anytime, anywhere. Uh, at Boca Raton, Florida, Rick Macy Tennis Center. Uh, it's like Disneyland and Candyland, a place like no other. But if they give me a holler through email, text, whatever, I'll get back to them and definitely get a plan. And we'll have that info in the show notes as well. Dr. Niva, how about you? Is is there a website where people can reach out to you? Oh, yeah, I, I have a lot of, I have a website. Okay. It's drniva.com. But we also have, I have uh, a lot of social media pages. I think just like Rick, like on Instagram, Facebook, um, and LinkedIn. So if people want to connect with me, I think they do. Uh, they can find me there. I love it. I love it. Well, thank you both so much for taking time. We're recording this on a Saturday afternoon. So, um, and right before New Year's, so I appreciate you guys <laughs> taking time to be with us. And um, Rick, as, as always, I learn lots when we chat. So um, I hope you'll come back next time. You know, there's uh, something to discuss and there's always something to discuss when we're talking junior tennis. So look forward to meeting up with you both again very soon. To my audience, thank you so much for tuning in and we will catch you next time on Parenting Aces. <laughs>